Um, how fitting is that song? We didn't have time to uh, change notes, but I, um, I'm talking today on purity, and, um, and I think that came from a pure heart, amen? amen. And uh, I love the, the part where it says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. We're going to be talking about purity today. And uh, three boys, three boys were boasting about their fathers, and one boy said, my dad is so fast, he can shoot an arrow, and before the arrow hits the target, he can run and grab it out of the air. The other, the other guy said, well, yeah, well, my dad's so fast that he can shoot a rifle at a deer when he goes hunting, and he can hit the animal, and before the animal falls, he's there to catch the animal. And the third son said, well, yeah, well, my dad's got you both beat. Because every day he gets off work at 4, and by 3.30, he's home. <laughs> and again, today we're talking about purity. And I use that little story to share that uh, as a father, I have two beautiful little girls that watch me. And they, uh, every word I say, everything I do, they're watching me. And just like that son in this little story... His father was teaching him and instilling in him uh, a motive. Uh, and, and some would say, well, that's, that motive was, you know, he was teaching him dishonesty. He would get paid for till 4, but what time was he home? 3.30? And so I use that because, uh, again, today I want to talk about purity. And some would say that that father was showing again, demonstrating uh, something that's unethical, something that's wrong, bad, or even evil. And I want to confess that uh, I've been there. I've done that. I've done evil. I've done wrong. And, uh, and so today I want to talk about how God looks at me and how purity is part of our journey. Okay, so I've entitled my sermon today, See No Evil, Speak No Evil, Hear No Evil, and Do No Evil. Let's pray. God, this is your time. We ask that you would anoint my lips, that everything I say would be pleasing to you. And that your children, that we would leave this church knowing today that we've heard from you, that we are loved, and that you are wanting to journey with us each and every moment of our days. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're familiar with that concept, right? It's a Japanese proverb where you have three little monkeys, some argue four, about the monkey that covers his eyes, plugs his ears. You're familiar with that picture? Okay. Um, and as widely as that is circulated, Wikipedia, which is a good source, right? Not really. But Wikipedia has a number of different explanations for what that proverb really means. And so I want to share them really quickly before I get into the word. So according to Wikipedia, those three to four monkeys or apes have varying, various meanings. In a Buddhist tradition, the tenets of that proverb are about not dwelling on evil, evil thoughts, evil things, Okay. Uh, in the Western world, both the proverb and the image are often used to refer to a lack of moral responsibility on the part of people who refuse to acknowledge bad behavior, looking the other way or pretending that it's not existing. Uh, to some, some use that uh, to signify a code of silence against gangs or organized crime. See no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. Obviously, they're doing the evil, but they're pretending it's not. And so really, what it's talking about is a code of conduct, okay? Now, I want to, uh, again, I bring that up because I want to talk about an even greater source that shows us where our conduct should come from. And it's not Wikipedia, it's where? The Word of God. And so today, we're going to talk about, again, purity, and uh, this is the last sermon on my series of 1 Timothy 4.12. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Timothy 4.12. And this is the last, um, kind of the last uh, part of this message. And this is what it says, 1 Timothy 4.12. And I'll just read it to recap. It says this, Don't let anyone look down on you because of your age, young age. But be an example for believers in speech, in actions, in love, and in faith, and in purity. So today, again, we're talking about purity. 
And what does that mean, really? Um, so again, last time I'm talking about uh, uh, 1 Timothy 4:12, and um, again we tied in faith the last time with uh, love, or sorry, with our actions. Faith without works is what dead. And so today we're talking again about purity. So let's look at what uh, when you kind of peruse through the Old Testament and New Testament. I want to just quickly share with you some texts that highlight a purity. And so to give us a big context of what purity is, uh, and then uh, I want to talk about five uh, things that we can do as we desire to be pure in, in all of those things. So according to the Old Testament, and this is according to the Bible Dictionary, uh, Will, Walter M. Dunnett, he wrote notes on this, and, uh, and as I was studying, I found this interesting. So in the Old Testament, we're familiar that uh, purity, in the Hebrew sense, is an emptying or being cleaned. Okay, the verb appears about 40 times in most occurrences with an ethical, moral, or forensic sense. Purity is opposed to being guilty. It stands over against such conduct or attitudes as unfaithfulness to God's covenant, as seen in Hosea 8.1. Uh, rebellion uh, against God's laws and unfaithfulness to God's, uh, to God's laws. And purity consists of clean hands, found in Genesis 25, and innocence. In Psalms 26 to 6 and 73, 13, uh, also highlights the, the idea of innocence. So purity is related to guiltless, blameless, or innocent behavior. And in Exodus 23, 7, we see that an innocent person is portrayed as someone who is righteous, as measured by the demands of the law. Okay, so that's what defines purity in the Old Testament. And oftentimes, it, it was all about consecration. Before God can come and speak to the people, he would tell Moses, like in Exodus, before I can come onto the Mount Sinai, what should they do? They needed to consecrate themselves, okay? To go before God and, and give themselves before God and um, ask him to, to be there, to forgive them, and to anoint them. And then God came near. So an idea of being cleaned or emptied, okay? So again, purity is related to guiltless, blameless, or innocent behavior. An innocent person is portrayed as someone who is righteous as measured by the demands of the law. Last week, uh, no, two weeks ago, I got pulled over twice by the police. And uh, one, I was on my way back from board meeting. It was kind of late. And uh, I, threw, I drove through a yellow light, and there was another truck right on my left. And, um, and so right behind me, as soon as that happened, I saw lights come on. Now, what do you typically do when you see lights? You know, speed up. <laughs> so the good, as the good citizen, I started pulling over because I was hoping he was going to go by me. Well, he did, but he stopped right directly in front of both of me and the truck. And so we had to slam on our brakes before we ran into the back end of this cop cruiser. And so we all stop. He gets out in a hurry and approaches the truck from the front on the passenger side. And I don't know why he had... Where's Rick? Is this normal? Okay. All right. So, all right. So he approaches the car and it's nighttime. And he goes to the truck and I don't know what he says because now I'm like, I have my hands on the steering wheel because I will not move them. I don't want them to think I'm trying to grab something. Or, so they're here. And uh, what is that? Uh, 11 and 3, you know. And so I'm there holding the steering wheel. And uh, he goes to the truck, says something, comes to me. And he says, license and registration. Sure, sure, officer. And I'm nervous because I don't get pulled over much. And um, except for last week. And uh, so I give him my registration. I'm like, it's in my glove box. Do I have permission to go in my glove box? You know, because I don't want him to think I have anything in there that's, that would hurt him. So I get my registration, and I go to give him my license. I flip open my phone case, which has my license, typically, and my license is gone. And so I'm like, officer, I don't know how to explain this. And now I'm thinking, okay, think of excuses. And um, so I start giving him excuses. Well, I'm on my way back from church. I'm a pastor. And uh, my license is probably in my army uniform because I just got, I had, I had just came back from Utah visiting two units. And, and literally my license was still in my other wallet 
which has my military ID and all these other things that I travel with. And so he's like, okay, well, uh, registration, I mean, uh, insurance. I'm like, okay, I can do insurance. Open it again, expired. <laughs> so now I'm like, oh, this is not going to end well. So according to the law, I have now been found guilty of multiple things. Okay? So I almost called Deputy Lopez and said, help me, brother. I didn't, because he already told me not to do that. Um, <laughs> And so uh, I, I'm trying, okay, okay. So I give him all I have. He leaves, and for about a half an hour, I'm just sitting there sweating. Bullets, like, oh, man. And I know my wife is worried because it's now like 1030 at night. And uh, my phone is dead, or else I could have showed him my insurance on my phone. Uh, you know, so I'm like, all these things against me. So he comes back, and he says, um, okay, well, things have checked out. And I'm like, that's good. He's like, by the way, you have a, a, a taillight that's out and a headlight. I'm like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> so he says, well, you know, um, your story checked out. You were not. Uh, and I said, well, sir, why did I get pulled over to begin with? Was it my lights? He's like, no, um, you were drag racing. <laughs> I'm like, drag racing? I'm like, I am in a Volvo V50 station wagon with no lights and all this apparent issues. And the truck that I was drag racing that also blew the yellow light had pool supplies in the truck. And I'm like, so I'm thinking to myself, clearly they're not very good drag racers. But he said, the guy in the truck confirmed that you were not racing and he was not racing you. So he said, you were not racing. I said, no, I was not racing. And so he says, okay, get your lights fixed. Uh, make sure you have insurance, proof of insurance. Uh, make sure you have your driver's license on you. I said, yes, officer. Um, so clearly, I was not found righteous, but I want to tell you I was shown grace and mercy. Amen. And when I talk about purity today, I'm going to hit some topics that are not talked much about in the church when it comes to purity. Um, but I want us to always remember that there is grace and mercy to meet our own purity. And, and, and so how do we become purity? We're going to talk about that right now. So five things, all right? Uh, but however, before I go to the five, I want to illustrate what the New Testament kind of changes gears with purity and goes from this ritual idea uh, of, you know, um, what is talked about most of the time in consecration, and it goes into more of an emphasis on, um, from ritual purity to focuses on moral purity. All right, or, or purification. And that's seen in the very text we've been looking at this whole time, 1 Timothy 4, 12. All that is talking about is purity. So last time we spoke, we talked about why does God do what he does? He does it because of what? Big L word, love. And we ought to do the same thing. But what I want to talk about today, uh, turn to your Bibles, 1 Timothy 1, 5. 1 Timothy 1.5. And Paul is talking here and warning against false teachers of the law. And he gives a command in verse uh, 5. The goal of this command is love. Okay? Is love. Which comes, again, verse 5, 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. So again, this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. So Paul sees this, and he challenges Timothy. As believers, you need to make sure that our words, our actions, all that is all done out of love, but where is the love? What motivates the love? A pure heart. Okay, a pure heart. I don't know if you uh, remember this movement, but I want to share two concepts before I go into the five uh, takeaways of, of more like application. Um, but two concepts swept the nation. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, it was called the, the uh, WWJD movement. And I say movement because it was huge. And, uh, and according to, according to uh, Mortal Journey, which provides extensive history 
uh, of fads and trends from the uh, 1800s through modern day, this uh, website company estimated that in the 1990s, a range of WWJD bracelets were sold up to the 15 million to to 52 million uh, pieces of bracelets. That's how many were sold from the 1990s, okay? Um, and, and if you're not familiar with that, it was simply something that you put on and a great concept. How many wore a WWJ bracelet? Yeah, I did. I was guilty, you know, not guilty of it, but I, I did wear it and I wore it as a reminder. Okay, and what did it stand for? What would Jesus do? Great concept. Great concept. It came out of a, an amazing devotional. Um, and so 15, what was it, million? Okay, to 52 million. I know that's a large, drastic difference, but the principle is there. A lot were sold. Okay, and so people would wear these bracelets um, in in a manner that they would, uh, before doing or saying or attempting to do something, they would look at that and say, what would Jesus do? And hopefully it would change their action. Okay, so oftentimes I would look at that bracelet and say, what would Jesus do? Oh, okay. And then I would try to do the opposite, okay? And I used it. Uh, uh, oftentimes, it was to, uh, um, to be abstinent on something, okay? Something selfishly I wanted to do, that bracelet reminded me. Then they moved to true love can wait. That's a concept that they tried to market to our younger kids, uh, our, our little girls, to high school girls, even to high school boys. They would give you a purity ring. Okay, and this was a big thing that they would try to instill in our younger kids that love can wait. Okay, abstinence. Wait until you're married before you give yourself away. And that was the whole concept behind that movement. Um, And again, both of those concepts are great. But they don't really touch the heart of the matter. Okay, Uh, a lot of us cannot do certain things out of different motives. Some can be fear. I don't want to do this because I'm afraid of the consequences. Or I don't want to do this because... And so, those two concepts were great, but I want to talk about something even more deeper than that. Okay, today. So, again, those two were out there, those concepts. Here are five, um, you know, I think principles that I will strive to implement when I look at purity. And what does that really mean? Because here's the reality. Number one, purity is a heart choice. Purity has to be a heart choice. With all the emphasis placed on abstinence, like that bracelet I told you, or purity rings, um, abstinence and purity are not the same. They are not the same. Purity actually has a very little to do with sex. And that's the idea of the purity ring. Please wait and, and believe me, girls, I, I, that's the message I want to share to my own girls. And how do I teach them about purity versus abstinence? Purity actually has very little to do with sex. In fact, sexual acting out is a, the ultimate manifestation of impurity. So sexually acting out is the opposite of purity. It's impurity. So when we act out, okay? So anybody, Christian or not, can be abstinent. And purity has to be a heart attitude that affects how I live my life, not just how I use my body. Let's open our Bible to Psalms 51 today. I'm going to be sticking with Psalms 51 as I talk about these five principles. Okay. And I don't have a clock, so that's good news for you, because there's no clock there. So I don't know how long I'm preaching, so we'll just go through all my notes, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll finish. I won't, I won't be pressed for time. Okay, so Psalms 51, verse 10. When we start talking about purity and realizing that it's a heart thing, um, it's a heart choice, I think this is a great place to turn. So Psalms 51, verse 10 says this, Create in me a pure heart, 
O God. Create in me a pure heart, O God. That's the beginning of it all. What, uh, who wrote that? David. And that comes, that's a prayer, that whole chapter is a prayer, after what has happened to him. Nathan the prophet comes to him and says, guess what, buddy? Here's the story. And David is like, that man, I mean, that is, and he says, you are the man. And so now David, with that realization, the Holy Spirit now convicting him, begins to say, oh, have mercy on me, oh God, according to your unfailing love. And he begins this intimate prayer that is so real that you can hear the words and, you know, and the, uh, the plea. And, and, and so it's a heart thing. And 5110 says how that all begins. Create in me a pure heart. Who? Matt? No. Who? God. So purity begins with who? God. Number two, purity requires God's strength. He's the one that initiates the pure heart, but guess what? He's also the one that needs to continue that desire to be pure, okay? And so he needs to give us the God strength. You know, I grew up in an academy time where uh, a week of prayer speaker would come in and share with us amazing truth about the things that I listened to, the things that I were doing. They were wrong. Okay, I was opening up my life to avenues that were wrong, and, and the devil was playing on that. And so at the end of the week, the uh, week of prayer speaker would do an appeal. Have you ever been part of an appeal? He would give an appeal, and we would just flock. And, and they would do boxes, and if you wanted to bring something that you wanted to surrender and give up in your life, you would come and you would, and so I broke CDs of music that I used to listen to and movies. I did all those things. The Holy Spirit truly was convicting But guess what? After that spiritual high went, I went right back to my old ways. Why? Because I was trying to do it in my strength and not whose? God's. Purity requires God's strength. Because abstinence often involves our physical interactions with others around us or other avenues or other gateways, it can be accomplished through sheer grit I am not going to do this again. Determination, logic, or fear. Okay, abstinence, just plain abstinence. We can, we can say to ourselves, I am not going to do it this time for a while. For a while. But because purity is more personal and less visible, it requires the working of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. It requires His grace and His enabling uh, to, in order for us to live lives that honor and glorify him. Psalms 5111. 5111. So remember, purity requires God's strength. Verse 11 says this, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. King David wanted the Holy Spirit to be in his life and active. And that's what he was praying for. That's what I want. That's what I want to pray for, is the Holy Spirit to be active in my life, to giving me the strength, not because, you know, again, I can be okay for a while in my own strength, but eventually I will fall, and I will fall hard. So the Holy Spirit needs to be there to give us that strength, and David knew that, and that's why he was praying for it. Number three, again, number one was what? Purity is a what? A heart choice. Number two, purity requires God's strength, not my strength. Number three, Purity is not a one-time choice. It's an important decision, yes, but it also takes, makes, uh, needs to be a daily decision. Purity is daily or even moment by moment because the battle is real. And sometimes it gets even harder uh, the way life throws stresses at us. So preparation for that battle does not take place in one moment. And victory is not guaranteed because of the choices you made yesterday. One can sign all of the contracts you would like, but guess what? You're familiar with contracts? Younger in my days, I used to have a a, a thing on my computer called Covenant Eyes. A great resource for men, for women, uh, because pornography is rampant. And even if you're not looking for it, it, it'll blop up on your screen. Okay, and that's what the devil likes. 
that slight distraction, and then you become uh, addicted. You become, that becomes to feed you, and you begin to see all your relationships start to fall apart, okay? So I remember earlier on, before I even worried about that, my buddy recommended Covenant Eyes. And so I was paying monthly for this resource that I felt I didn't really need, but I wanted to protect myself. I wanted to protect my wife and my family. And so I signed up for this. And, uh, and what it would do is it would send sites of what I visited to my, my, covenant, my covenant friends. And it would show them they could read any time what sites I was looking for, and they could then hold me accountable by saying, hey, I can see kind of the sites you're looking at. They're kind of questionable. And, you know, can I pray with you? And they would be there in a loving way to support and encourage, even though, again, it wasn't an issue. But if purity is a one-time choice, then, then it would be simple. I would say, well, I don't need to deal with this, and so I'm pure now. No, it'll come at us moment by moment sometimes. And so it's more than just signing a contract because it'll come at us. Okay, so purity is not a one-time thing. So what is it? Psalms 51, 12. Purity is a restoration. For even though we've fallen, God desires us to begin pure. And he's the one that does it. And so verse 12 says this, Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Again, that idea of sustaining daily, moment by moment, and who's doing it? God, through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Through the Holy Spirit. So purity is not a one-time choice. It's an everyday or even moment-by-moment -moment choice to live that way. Peter is ultimately a personal choice we each make by accepting Jesus Christ into our lives. Uh, and, and if we've fallen, okay, let's look at verse 1. Because again, the context of this prayer is a king that fell and fell hard, right? For who? Bathsheba, okay? So this is what David's prayer is, recognizing that he's fallen, that the Holy Spirit is, uh, through Nathan, impressing him, and this is his prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash all of my iniquity and cleanse me from all of my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak, and justified when you judge. So again, it's a, pure, it's a, thing, it's a personal thing. So who was King David praying for? Was he praying for his people? No. He was saying, blot out my transgressions. Blot out my iniquity, O oh God, according to your unfailing love and your great compassion. Is that good news? When we do fall, God is there to forgive us. Forgiveness is not unconditional. It's what? Conditional. We have to go to God and ask for forgiveness. His love is unconditional, amen? But when we fall, we have to go to God and say, God, I have fallen. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. The Bible says that he's faithful and just to forgive us. And lastly, purity is a lifestyle, not simply just a part of your life, our life, my life. Uh, just, uh, Jessica Harris challenges her readers in an article she wrote about the danger for those who just invite God to be a small part of their life. Okay, And she compares that to the fish sticker. And she calls it the Jesus fish syndrome. You know what fish sticker I'm talking about? You see it on the cars, okay? Um, and, and what she says in the article is when we only give God part of our, a little part of our lives, that's like slipping, slapping a sticker on our car and then driving and everything in the car doesn't matter because that sticker is on the car. And so when you're driving and somebody cuts you off, like that happened to me in California. On my way to California, there's really only one thing that wants me to, uh, uh, and I'll confess, uh, flip the bird, give the finger. <laughs> I don't do it, uh, but this day I did give the finger, okay? I was driving, and I wait for it, it wasn't the finger. I was driving, and when those guys get in the fast lane, what is that for? 
fast, not speeding, not breaking the law, but passing. Somebody that's going, and so in, on my way to California, it happened so many times that my patient, I mean, it was moment by moment, God, please give me pure thoughts, because these tractor trailers would be racing, and, and nobody was winning. And here, all these cars are lined up behind, because nobody's going anywhere. And so finally, they would pass, and, uh, and then sometimes they won't move over, and so that's when I have to go to the right in the slow lane and pass them. And, um, and so... That's when I gave them the finger. I look, and I say, good for you, buddy. Move over, you know, type of thing. It wasn't the finger, but it was the, like, good job. And I was very sarcastic, and that's not good either, okay? <laughs> very sarcastic. And I was like, probably should have been, because that's, you know, anyway. And so, slapping a fish sticker on our car does not make us any more pure and somebody that does not have a fish sticker on their car. And so what God desires is much more than a portion of our life. He wants all of it. Okay? He wants all of it. So lastly, I want to challenge you as I wrap up today to take that prayer, Psalms 51, and pray over it today in your home with your families. And talk about what it means to truly be pure. So Psalms 51, as I wrap up, does this. It shows us uh, two things. So purity addresses these two things. How we approach and worship an almighty God and holy God and realize that it's a choice that we are helpless to make without him. So the Holy Spirit has to be pricking our conscience, our, our spirit that, you know, God wants you and God wants to create in you a pure heart. And we need to come to him. And then, all, and then everything else comes from that. So the first thing is that idea of that God is the one that makes us pure, not ourselves, and then, then how we relate to others, okay? We mentioned to you that uh, 1 Timothy 1 says the command is to love, and that love needs to come from what? A pure heart, okay? A pure heart. And again, God is the only one that can create in us a pure heart, So this week, I want to challenge us to do just that, to realize that purity is a heart thing, to give God full access of our lives, not portions of our lives, full access, and realize that even though we've fallen, that God still gives us mercy and grace and wants to pick us up, just like King David realized, create in me a pure heart and renew a right spirit in me.